My name is Dakota. I'm with uh, Krebs Stamos Group, where I'm a China consultant. Um, I'm also a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council, and I'm the first talk after lunch. So you're awake, you're full, and you're paying attention. And I'm going to talk about uh, China's cybersecurity policies that bolster its talent pipeline and its capability development. So I'm going to paint the picture of when Xi Jinping comes into office in 2013. Uh, at this point, we know that code can slow down Iranian centrifuges. Uh, Snowden has leaked a, a bunch of secrets uh, to the press that's influenced how people think about this issue. Um, and China's own security services have dismantled a network um, of US informants who were using website, uh, websites to uh, communicate with their handlers. Xi Jinping comes into office in 2013 and sets cybersecurity uh, policy as one of his top priorities. He stands up a leading small group in 2014. This is promoted to uh, a committee of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee, uh, one of about 28 uh, committees at this level within the organization. Uh, it signals that it's a very significant issue and that the provincial and municipal governments and party leaders should respond to this political demand signal. Um, at the same time, in 2016, that this uh, leading small group is elevated to a committee, he stands up the uh, Cyberspace Administration of China. This is a public-facing government bureaucracy that matches the uh, Chinese Communist Party Central Committee for Cybersecurity and Informatization, uh, both in address, in personnel, and in actual offices. And so when we hear about um, investigations against tech companies from the CAC, it is actually the same political body um, as that committee within the Chinese Communist Party. Next slide. So they start to focus on talent policies in 2015. Uh, this is after the committee's been stood up and, and people start to focus on this issue. And China has recognized that the United States has done very well in its cyber power up until this point, owing to a focus on education. So in 2015, China uh, begins a review of cybersecurity degree curriculums. Uh, this is based on the United States' National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. In 2016, they begin building a national cybersecurity talent and innovation base in Wuhan. Uh, and then in 2017, they launched a program that mirrors uh, the United States' Centers of Academic Excellence in Cyber Operations. In 2017, they certified nine schools as these world-class cybersecurity schools. Uh, and then two years later, they certify four more, bringing that total up to 11. And then in the same time in 2017, they've stood up uh, this like academic infrastructure for degree curriculums, the ones that are the best. Uh, but they need students to attend these institutions and they need people to be attracted to the cybersecurity field. And so this dual-hatted approach to making this happen occurs through this very oppressive, you can't go abroad and you can't do international software vulnerability competitions anymore. Next slide. So Xi Jinping is trying to change this attitude of um, seeing hackers as flowers in this field of wheat that are meant to be found by policymakers and then later utilize for pur purposes uh, for, for hacking targets. So like, if we look at the APT40 group and the DOJ indictment um, and the intrusion truth information around that, or we look at the Anthem insurance hack and its overlap with Southeast University, there are actually students competing in cybersecurity competitions who are later drafted into hacking operations of the state. They are meant to find software vulnerabilities for use by the state. It's very haphazard. It's not how a mature bureaucracy functions, uh, particularly when considering intelligence collection. And so changing this attitude is a critical part of this talent pipeline. In order to do that, they need to get students and people interested in this job. They hold back their best security researchers from traveling abroad. They launch uh, a program called the, uh, uh, let's see, InfoSec Triathlon. It's a joint, uh, jointly operated uh, Capture the Flag program that runs across China. Uh, it's run by the Ministry of State Security's 13th Bureau, uh, the China Information Technology Security and Evaluation Center, and the Ministry of Education. And the goal is specifically to promote people's interest in pursuing this as a as a career field. Um, and then in 2018, Tianfu Cup gets stood up as kind of this replacement for, you can't go to pwn to own, but we're still gonna compensate you for these vulnerabilities. And of course, uh, charges of these vulnerabilities being used in internal hacking campaigns uh, emerge a couple years later. Thanks for reporting from MIT Technology Review. Next slide. But that's not to ignore the fact that they are interested in the software vulnerabilities that are uh, created by researchers and then um, 
you know, released to the public at these competitions. So in 2017, there's a quote from the head of Chihu 360 where he compares software vulnerabilities to a national resource on par with things like coal and timber. And this attitude typifies uh, one of the two reasons that these security researchers are not allowed to travel abroad. You can see the same interest in, in harvesting, collecting, and utilizing software vulnerabilities in the 2017 Robot Hacking Games, which is replication of DARPA's 2016 Cyber Grand Challenge to promote research into automated software vulnerability discovery, exploitation, and patching. Those competitions, uh, the Robot Hacking Games, still run in China. They've held at least seven as part of my last look, and they're run by the People's Liberation Army Equipment Development Department. So this is the branch of the military specifically responsible for procuring and finding capabilities that are necessary for military operations. And then in 2021, they codify their interest in tapping into this uh, software security pipeline uh, by making it a rule that you have to disclose software vulnerabilities uh, found conducting uh, research within 48 hours to the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. Uh, and this is a recreation of an operation that we saw in 2017, thanks to research at Recorded Future, that showed the Chinese intelligence services were collecting vulnerabilities that were reported to their national database, using these vulnerabilities in operations, and then only reporting them publicly um, after those operations had been busted uh, by folks in, in this room. And so that lends itself to a policy environment where we get to the 2022 Microsoft Defense Report where, guess what, they're using a bunch of zero days. And they have them because they've invested in the capabilities to create them, they've withheld talent from traveling abroad, and they've facilitated an ecosystem within China uh, that's focused on doing this research. And they've uh, started uh, basically this pipeline and they're not allowing it to go overseas. Next slide. So all along the way, they are creating physical infrastructure to support uh, the, the research that's being conducted on attacking uh, both regular computer networks and then operational technology networks. Uh, and so China builds its first cyber range in 2010. Uh, it's mentioned in a couple places, and then I can't find any record of it. And then a couple years later, in 2015, uh, one gets stood up in Guiyang. The national government likes what it does and what it's doing. They commend it for supporting uh, offensive and defensive national exercises. Uh, and it's got a bunch of uh, I ICS and operational technology equipment in store. They do the same thing uh, with Chengdu's Peak Geek competition in 2019, which is meant to create NATO's, uh, um, uh, NATO's cyber defense exercise. Uh, in uh, Guangdong province, there's Pengcheng Labs, where they're putting a bunch of computational power into determining whether or not reinforcement learning can improve how cyber operations are run, uh, specifically looking at attack graphs, and then uh, state-owned enterprises also run uh, uh, cyber ranges, in this case KASIC, uh, which does military uh, missile development and satellite operations, uh, has their own cyber range focused specifically um, on these assets. Next slide. So, uh, like all good researchers, I find the best stuff before uh, I'm supposed to come up and talk on stage within about 36 hours of doing so. Um, so I find this document online. It's the Cybersecurity Talent Actual Combat Abilities White Paper Attack and Defense Capabilities Edition. Very cool name, very mundane report. It's 85 pages long, and a lot of it is demographic information. Uh, just like Sizajin came up on stage and talked about an interest in promoting diversity within the U.S. ecosystem, the first graph in this report from China is a breakdown by gender. Uh, it's 85% male uh, and the remainder is women. It's not great. Um, next slide. What I like most about this report is they basically said, I was right, that the world-class uh, cybersecurity schools are meant to copy the NSA uh, DHS programs for centers of academic excellence. Next slide. But what I found most interesting about this report, uh, and it's 85 pages, which to be clear, I have skimmed, okay? <laughs> there is a translation coming out from the Center of Security and Information Technology uh, at Georgetown. But the three needs that they found most present in these uh, focus groups was the need for people who are competent penetration testers, people who are good reverse engineers, and people who specialize in software vulnerability discovery and exploitation. Last slide. But the real point of the report is to summarize basically what I presented to you today. They have a development model for their China uh, uh, hacking capabilities uh, pipeline, uh, for both from a talent uh, development and a capabilities development, and they call it the four plus three model. And they think that people who are coming out of this talent pipeline should be competent in the four abilities, and they should demonstrate them in the three ways that they've articulated here. 
This is an issue we're all going to have to deal with. China has gone from finding flowers in a field of wheat to cultivating an entire harvest of people who go to work in those bureaucracies and that we all have to deal with. Thank you.